This webinar is hosted through the New England Prevention Technology Transfer Center, the New England PTTC, which is a program funded through the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration through a cooperative agreement. The PTTC provides training and technical assistance services to prevention professionals and stakeholders in the six New England states. Products include in-person, distance learning, and online trainings, as well as prevention tools and resources. The New England PTTC is one of 10 regional centers and two national focus area centers providing these services across the country. You can learn more about the New England PTTC or other PTTC regions at our website, pttcnetwork.org. The PTTC network uses affirming language to promote the application of evidence-based and culturally informed practices. The use of affirming language inspires hope. Language matters. Words have power. People first. We invite you to incorporate these practices into your own work as well. And I will hand over um, today's presentation to um, our great presenters, Robin and Jamie. We are very excited to have you, um, looking forward to hearing from you, and I am going to turn my camera off so that I'm not distracting, um, but I'll be here still, so if, if anything comes up, I can, I can pop back up for you. Okay. Thanks, Kristen. Hello, everyone, and happy Thursday. My name is Jamie Comstock, as you can see from my screen, and I'm here with my partner in crime, Robin Carr. And um, by day, we are certified prevention specialists in Bangor, Maine, and we work at Bangor Public Health and Community Services. Um, we have both been working in prevention for, um, I'll just say, dozens of years and leave it at that, quite a few. Um, by, by night and other times, we are co-founders of a little side gig company that we formed called Info Inspired. And um, through, through Info Inspired, we teach people how to develop and design amazing presentations. And we, we really enjoy our partnership with the NEPTTC. We have presented our signature presentation development and design um, training a couple of times for them, several times, and in fact, most recently this summer. So if any of you were able to catch that, um, it's great to, um, great to have you with us today. And for those of you who haven't, um, maybe that's something you can check out later if, if you think it would be helpful. We'd love to have you. Um, so over time, Robin and I have developed, designed, and given lots of presentations about marijuana prevention. And today we're gonna share our approach with you and we're gonna give you some of our best tips and tricks. But to set the stage, I wanna just real quickly talk about the landscape of the, the cannabis industry right now. Um, and before, before I do a little bit of that, I wanted to touch on that these marijuana presentations that we do, the marijuana prevention presentations that we all do, um, they can be a little bit intimidating. Um, they can be, marijuana is a flashpoint issue right now. There are lots of shifting policies and um, changing environments that are happening. And there's also a lot of information to, uh, a lot of information to convey. So we're gonna help you just sift through all of that today. Um, it'll, be, it'll be fun and easy. And we're also going to help you approach all of this from an audience-centered standpoint. And um, as preventionists, we tend to be really comfortable talking about brain development and addiction and data. And a lot of our presentations approach the issue of marijuana prevention this way. And it actually, believe it or not, I'll tell you a secret, that isn't an approach that resonates with all audiences, believe it or not. Um, Robin and I have been caught time and again, and then we finally wisened up and um, started approaching it in the way we're going to talk about today. So um, to get us started, I, I wanted to touch on a little bit about the industry today. I think I know I had a misconception about what the goal of the industry was. 
And I, for a long time, thought the goal of the industry was to um, just to get people really high, like those YouTube videos you watch. And, um, you know, maybe I even imagined them trying to coerce my grandmother and trying to get high by smoking, you know, smoking marijuana. And in fact, that's a total misconception. What what the industry where they are going right now is they're seeking to provide reliable, repeatable experiences that can have a uniquely desired effect um, of the user's choosing. So the picture on this intro slide here does a really good job of illustrating that and illustrating where the industry is going. It's a little bit like a choose your adventure um, book. Maybe some of you remember those because the, the goal of the industry is to have its users choose the feeling they want and then be able to deliver that feeling or that effect to them um, with, with um, cannabis, basically. So if you can also kind of think about another kind of secondary goal is to replace as much as possible pharmaceuticals with with plant-based solutions so we're talking about doing things like you know reducing anxiety um, helping people sleep better those kinds of things so that's that's where the industry is going and i think that's something very helpful for you to understand as we embark on our 90-minute adventure today of marijuana prevention new conversations for changing times okay next slide so the types of audiences i know we give presentations to around marijuana prevention school systems that includes teachers and administrators um, we talk to municipal leaders and legislators and parents and the general community and employers you can do the next slide and then the the really important thing and the first place that we always start when we're doing these presentations is to really understand our audience and the reason you really want to understand your audience is that when you really know your audience you can craft messages that resonate with them remember in the beginning i told you that not everyone is jazzed about um, the concept of uh, healthy brain development as their primary motivational um, factor. And this is, this is what I mean. If you know your audience, then you will know that. And each type, each audience you, you present to will have a different set of unique needs and interests and especially legislators. So if you can figure, if you can imagine that, you know, a legislative body, whatever that is, whether it's your state legislators or municipal leaders, they're going to have like a um, a unique set of interests among themselves that they'll need to balance all of those all of those interests. And so, it's not intuitive to us what they're interested in. And so, we have to investigate and figure out what it is they are they are interested in. So, like I mentioned before, as preventionists, we care about kids, we care about preventing kids from initiating, but our audiences don't necessarily prioritize that same thing, and we can't assume that they do. And I'll, I, I think the other thing that's important to know is that your audience could change over time. So, if you've been working with one municipality, um, it could be that that the nature and the interests of that municipality and you know the the town council or whatever it is changes over time too so i'll give you an example of uh working in the town of orno maine where i live and um they were up in arms about a vape store that located on a real highly visible corner in 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 the town um probably the most visible corner in town and they wanted to do all they could to um they just thought it was so inappropriate for this vape store to be located where everyone could see it um and in time what happened was the vape store went out of business and so they didn't have to worry about that but this the same body the town council um was then a few years later talking about you know, 
trying to figure out if they wanted to locate marijuana shops in the same kind of village area. So even that's the same body. Um, and then it has over time a couple of different perspectives. And so it's important to know what the perspective is before you, um, before you go in there. Okay, next slide. So all that's, that's easy, I guess, um, knowing that you have to know your audience. And the way that we approach this particular task is we talk about building audience avatars. And so each, each of these audiences is gonna have a different avatar. And the place, some of the places that you're gonna get information about these avatars or these audiences can be pretty easily found. So, you know, one thing you could do is talk to talk to people, you know, who live in that town or who go to that school or who know those people. Another like real valuable place these days is um, looking in social media. So there is no shortage of people posting their their views um, and their beliefs and what they hold, you know, near and dear on social media. Um, if you look especially on the pages of legislators and municipal leaders, you will have a really solid understanding of, of what they care about and what they prioritize. Um, we watch government meetings, um, we watch school board meetings, and it's a great time right now because all of those meetings are, are televised and recorded because we're, we're doing all of this, this virtual learning. Um, so probably now more than ever, candidates and elected officials are posting about things that matter to them, and it's your time to um, to really do some some data mining and and figure that out. Um, kind of tangentially, I wanted to make a note here that there are, there are, um, there's probably a lot of data that you have and that you want to share with with your audiences and with specific respect to legislators, keep in mind that legislators really wanna hear stories. As much as we wanna share a bunch of data with them, what they wanna hear are stories. And so your, um, your efforts are gonna go a lot further if you can figure out a way to turn your data into a story that they can, um, that they can receive and then they can share. And I'll give you another kind of, um, kind of example of this. When we wanted to familiarize our local towns with the types of marijuana products that were coming onto the market and the way that they marketed to kids, we um, it just happened. I mean, maybe you call this a stroke of luck or whatever, but one day I was walking with my daughter down the street in, in our town and on the, the big main street. And um, we found an empty edible package and it had you know, bright colors and, and characters on the front. It was some kind of s'more package, um, s'more flavored. It smelled, if you like s'mores, it smelled really good. I'm not a s'more aficionado, so I didn't really like it, but um, I figured my daughter smelled it. She thought it smelled good. She's She was probably nine then, she's 11 now. Um, and anyway, so I, I grabbed this package. I felt like I had scored, like it was a gold mine. So I, I grabbed this package, I brought it back to the office and we've taken that thing all over the place with us just to demonstrate to people, this is, we know the data, this is um, historically speaking, we, we know um, the kinds of marketing strategies that, um, that the industry is wanting to use. And so here is a real live example of that in action. So um, I think you could go to the next slide now. Perfect. So what we call this building audience avatars um, and, and really getting to know our audience, we call this together, we call this building our presentation around our audience. And this is one of the things like a foundational, um, a, a foundational kind of requirement or thing that we, we always make sure we do. Um, if you can think of this as doing like audience homework or an audience assessment, we make sure that the audience and their interests are at the heart of every decision we make when we're planning our presentation. Um, this helps us tailor our content so it speaks to our audience um, personally and connects them with what they care about. All right, next slide. 
So how can you do this? We'll make it a little bit easier for you. We have a couple of handouts that we put in the, the, the handout tab on the right. If you click that, um, that little arrow, it'll pop down. And we have a, a grouping of handouts for you today. And the first one is called Building Your Audience Avatar. And the second one is called Determining the Gaps. And if you look at those, you can, and you go through and you answer those questions, you will have a really solid understanding of um, your specific audience and their interests, and you'll have clues about the ways that you can then engage with them. All right, take it away. So Jamie and I have talked, or Jamie so far has talked um, a good bit about our um, conversations with uh, municipalities and legislators, and and we've had many experiences. Um, there was this one time we went to a town meeting and it didn't go very well. And I'd love to say that that was oh <laughs> only one time, but it didn't go very well uh, many times, unfortunately. And fortunately, we've had many more opportunities to have continued conversations. Um, with folks at the municipal level and have worked on ways to refine our messaging and present information that resonates and that's actionable for these groups. And the reason why we're talking about this so much is because in the state of Maine, um, it started to become clear that at the municipal level, they were going to be tremendous environmental influencers when it came to an adult use marijuana market moving into the state. So. Um, essentially, if you're not from Maine, um, you may not know that we have uh, both a, um, a medical use law uh, that, and also adult use law that was um, enacted in 2016. And as part of that, our towns um, have an opera, they, uh, they need to opt in in order for, um, in order to allow businesses within their jurisdiction. So, we knew it was going to be really important to develop relationships with um, not just parents and schools and other sectors, but particularly municipalities, because they really were going to be setting drug policy for our state. Um, and some of the experiences that we had initially, I think what we did really well is that we did a lot of homework in terms of um, figuring out what some public health approaches would be. Um, lessons learned from tobacco and alcohol about what sorts of um, policies and what sorts of a regulatory framework that a, a municipality could set up in order to potentially reduce some of the um, any of the public health negative impacts that could add, come as a result of a commercial market and potentially marijuana businesses being cited in their towns and I think we did that part well. But I think where we fell down many times is understanding, I think initially the biggest issue that we had is we didn't understand very well how municipal government worked. And um, I really wish that they would go back and do a schoolhouse rock edition on this because <laughs> I think it would be really helpful to a lot of us. We just didn't get it. So I think initially we went to the table saying, this is from a public health perspective, what we believe would be <laughs> beneficial and we got a lot of feedback saying, these are just not things we can do, or it doesn't work within our framework. So we needed to really refine um, what our ask was and ensure that it was um, packaged in a way that they could take action on it. Um, I think there was this other time that came up that we thought we were doing a really great job by aligning ourselves with one um, city councilor only to find out, and, and we aligned ourselves sort of, I mean, and, and I say aligned ourselves, we had a, some rich conversations with this person because they seemed to really understand the public health approach. However, we did not know that this person didn't really carry much weight with the council and the whole rest of the council tended to vote in opposition of anything that this person um, was sharing. So as Jamie said, it's just really important to understand um, the makeup of these bodies and the same goes for town councils and you know, school struct, uh, the same goes for um, school boards and, and, and school administration and, and all those sorts of systems. It's really important. There are all these individual kingdoms and when we go into them, it's really beneficial for us to understand um, what's happening in there. Thanks, Robin. Okay, so we've talked about your audience and we've talked about how 
how you should approach them based on what their interests are. And there's another part of this equation that's super important. And this part of the equation is, is what is your goal as the presenter for your audience? And by goal, we mean the audience transformation. And um, we like to talk about basically like, how is your audience different when they enter the room versus um, how they are when, when they leave the room? And I liken this sometimes to a haircut. Like you, you walk into the salon and when you leave, your hair looks different somehow if that's what you've, you've gotten done, right? It's, it's shorter or blonder or darker or curlier or straighter, like whatever it is, you have a goal and that's the transformation. And so the, the, the goal for your presentation is kind of the same, it's the same thought. Um, and what you want to ask yourself is, what do I want, how do I want my audience to change as a result of my presentation? What do I want them to do with the information I'm providing? And what specific action do I want them to take? Um, so go ahead and click to the next, the next slide. When we are doing marijuana prevention presentations, typically, those goals are going to be in one of these three areas. We're, we're usually talking to people about changing a policy um, or educating them about the impacts of changing a policy, or we're asking them or suggesting or providing best practice information about adopting a new practice, or we're showing them how they can address a problem. I'll give you some examples of this. So in terms of changing a policy, Typically, um, the area we find ourselves in currently with retail marijuana um, is, is legalized and uh, municipalities must op opt in, um, is we find ourselves providing lots of information to them about how their land use decisions can affect, um, can affect and protect kids. So we talk about buffers. We talk about um, the impact of citing um, marijuana establishments away from where kids are. So away from schools and um, movie theaters and trampoline jump parks and places like that. And what the what those municipalities are, are doing is they're trying to figure out how to balance their business interests with public health interests. So um, that could be a lot of the work that um, folks who have already adopted marijuana, uh, retail marijuana policies and laws in, in their states, that could be what they're doing. Prior to, prior to marijuana being, um, retail marijuana being legal in Maine, the information we talked about was, um, you know, we provided information so municipalities could make a decision about whether or not they wanted um, you know, whether or not they wanted establishments within their, their borders. So um, that's, that's policy setting as well. So adopting new practices, the, this is the kind of conversation you might have with a school around um, their drug and alcohol policy and um, providing information about the benefit of in-school suspensions versus out-of-school su suspensions. And then addressing a problem could just be doing something like encouraging adults or uh, encouraging adults and parents to um, adopt safe storage um, practices for marijuana in their home. So those are the kinds of um, transformations, the types of goals that you might normally see or um, you might normally um, be talking about to people and to audiences with regard to your retail, to your marijuana prevention um, presentations. Okay, you could go to the next slide. And, and this is like, this is the magic spot. The magic spot is when you can merge what the audience cares about versus your goal for the audience transformation. That's, that's what you want to, that's the sweet spot. You have to figure out how to do that. Um, and basically what you're looking at is what are the elements of my audience and what do they care about? And how am I going to 
fill my presentation with content that makes them use those interests to align with the goal that I have for them. Um, okay, next slide. This is a piece of art that my son drew and they're vampire wolves. And um, the point of this slide is that that whole process is art. It is not science. It changes every single time. Um, and so um, just, just know that, know that um, it is unreliable. And, but if you work through the process, then you will have something, um, you'll have a reliable product and you will have, um, you'll have a platform with which to, to really communicate um, with your audience successfully. Okay, so I'm so excited about this section that I can hardly stand it because there is so much information to share with you. So Jamie did a beautiful job of talking about um, the, the science and art of understanding your audience and, and matching it with your goal for, um, for content that is going to be a, a perfect fit. And we are very fortunate to have a lot of amazing content to work with. So we're going to we're going to walk you through some of it. This is not an exhaustive list. And I also want to share with you that we have a handout with hyperlinks to many, many of the things. Um, so you don't need to necessarily take notes on this section. Um, and I will sort of flag you if there's something that isn't on that handout um, that you may want to jot down. But, you know, I've been working in this field for many years, but um, I can still remember, I think when I was part of the initial SPIF SIG grant that our state had, that marijuana wasn't a substance that we were addressing from a prevention perspective. I think we were just initially still focused on alcohol. Um, but in the last several years, one amazing thing that's happened is that there's been funding available and it's it's opened and we've, we've had more latitude with the funding streams that we've had. So we've had a preventionists coming to the table with really exceptional work um, that we're going to talk with you about. We're also going to share not only public health and sort of academic resources, but industry resources as well, and, and what you can find by looking um, at the media. So we call content from all of those places. And when we first, I think, did our very first iteration of our marijuana prevention presentation back in 2015, as Jamie said, that was really intimidating for us. And, and one of the reasons it was most in, intimidating for me is that I wanted to be sure that I was getting my story straight. And there wasn't a lot of information out there at that time. And I think I relied certainly on things from NIH and US CDC and a couple of other spots and the Rocky Mountain High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area, which is a law enforcement agency, had begun to release some information, but it was still sort of limited. And so I always felt really shaky. And we spent a very long time um, tracking back the resources that we had, searching for new information. And, and now for better or worse, we have, there's a lot of information from coming at us from all perspectives. And it's just, you know, our charge now really is to, to grab that and pull in the elements for the specific conversations that we need to have. And as Jamie said, it's going to be different every single time. Um, I also would say uh, there, there have been many times, I don't know if this has happened to you, that Jamie and I have been asked to uh, talk about, about cannabis. And, and one of the things that we've been requested to do is, um, you know, say, I guess I would say we've been asked to present the, um, what are we going to do to ensure that the other side has their information heard? And um, if that's something that you encounter um, from folks in the community, I wouldn't be surprised. And I think what, what we want to be sure that you understand is that um, there isn't a side to this information from our perspective. Um, as, as preventionists working in the field of public health, all the information that we share is focused on what is the interplay between public health and this substance and this industry that has begun to emerge. That's it. It's, it's not a side. It is, this is our area of expertise. This is our lane. So if people are interested in information from another lane, you know, that is, that is another lane. But all the information that we're going to share with you is about how to build those presentations that really talk about that interplay between public health 
and this substance and the related industry that we're beginning to see. So some of the first resources I'm going to share with you are uh, related to data that, um, that we have access to now. And I'm sharing this from the state of Maine. Obviously, this is, you know, uh, I'm sharing some New England resources primarily because that's where we live and the ones I'm most familiar with. So I think many of these are like resources across the country. So if you're tuning in from someplace else, this is just to give you a flavor for potentially some of the things that might be available in your area so that you can know and look for those. Um, what I wanted to highlight for you today is that some states, um, Maine is one, have started to share some open data with the public. So this is the Office of Marijuana Policy for the state of Maine's website, and they have an open data tab. And on underneath their open data section, you can get a lot of information about um, the emerging adult use market that's coming into Maine. You can get information on um, any pending licenses. You can find out the type of license for so how you know what type of business it is that's interested in siting in a particular community. You can see a map of where those businesses are located. You can track back who the owner and co-owners of those businesses are. And that's all information that you can use to share with communities. And I'm gonna give you an example. Um, so recently it's come into focus that the city of Portland is on track to have, I think 30 something um, marijuana retail establishments. And I, you know, fact check me on that. I think the number could be a little, little off. But that, um, it, and also, unfortunately enough, many of those were set to be, or are set to be cited in a community that um, has many, um, Im it's very rich with um, immigrants living in that community. And, and that population is one that, um, you know, for them to possess adult use marijuana could have really um, harmful consequences to their immigration status. So being able to have what was once abstract as what this could look like in Maine start to come into focus about what could happen, that's really powerful. And, and that can be used you know, in many other communities across Maine to say, this is what's happening in Portland. So this, just is, this is on your radar screen. Um, and I think you can do that you know, it, with, with open data from several of the states. So the same thing, the state of Commonwealth of Massachusetts has the Cannabis Control Commission and they also have an open data platform. One thing that I like about this is that they do some the tables for you, they do some um, data visualizations for you that I thought were kind of neat. Um, this one in particular look at, at the licenses awarded by type and you can set different filters so you can see which are active licenses, which are pending, you know, somewhere in the process for being active. So you can see all the different kinds and what track they're on. And that's just one example of something that's available. So I just encourage you to check out what's available out there from your um, state government if you have a state that has either um, legislated medical marijuana or adult use marijuana. This is another resource. Um, it's a few years old. I think it was uh, released in 2016, but um, the Vermont Department of, of Health did a health impact assessment on uh, marijuana regulation in the state. And it's got a lot of helpful nuggets in it. And one thing that I really liked in particular about it is that it did these tables of um, the impact of non-medical marijuana on all sorts of different health indicators. And then it talked about what that impact, it described what the impact was and the strength of the evidence of, of saying what the impact was. And that was just really helpful. So for example, at that time, um, so talking about cancer, it was really unclear whether or not um, cancer got better or worse or stayed the same with non-medical marijuana use. And there was it was a non-well-researched area. And just being able to say that um, and have those conversations and, and know the strength of the evidence is just it can be very helpful to you in particular situations. And that's just one nugget from that, that particular resource. We would be very remiss not to mention the New England PTTC um, and led by Scott Gagner, who is an, is, is an expert in and of himself. And the New England PTTC is um, doing specialty work in the area of marijuana prevention. And they have a robust set of resources already that's growing all the time. It's just phenomenal what's available now, um, and it's just rock solid. You can, you, it's a great foundation to build any of your um, communications and conversations on. 
these are a couple of things that you can find um, getting you excited to go check out the NEPTTC resources. They have a couple of slide decks. One is on cannabis and the adolescent brain. Another one is on the different forms, potency and health effects of cannabis. And again, this is the kind of stuff that when we started these, having these conversations, I was just desperate to get my hands on. It's just reliable. It's meticulously footnoted. You can trust this as a credible resource that you can share with confidence in your community. Dr. Eleanor Cancats, the Assistant Secretary for Mental Health and Substance um, Use at Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, has also done a good uh, amount of work on marijuana education, and she's got some great slide decks out there. So just, um, I think, I think I have a, I believe I do have a link to this presentation that Dr. McCants Katz presented. And in that, she did a really good job of going through um, use rates in the different states, what's happening with different um, age groups. She, her particular focus area for her seems to be um, those who are pregnant and breastfeeding. So there's some great information about that there. So check that out. I also mentioned earlier the Rocky Mountain High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area reports. They released one every year since 2015. You can find a range of information in there. Um, so that again is a good source and that's included on the resource link as well. The Main Center for Disease Control and Prevention really hot off the presses, a marijuana education toolkit they released and this is a tremendous resource. And and again, I'm speaking about Maine, but I suspect that many other states, um, Department of Health and Human Services is also working toward these resources for communities. There are many things to love about this marijuana education toolkit. Um, and one in particular that I really liked was the, there's a part of it that talks about this immigration piece. And I think it's something that wasn't really well understood until um, we were, as a state, faced with some of these issues, but it's really helpful to have that information. And that's just one nugget that is in the Marijuana Education Toolkit. Many states are also at the state level re uh, releasing these um, public education campaigns. And this is um, the state of Massachusetts public education campaign, more about marijuana. Maine has good to know Maine, uh, good to know the original Colorado, it's kind of um, loosely loosely framed up as the, similarly to the Colorado Good to Know campaign and different states um, are, are working on other great um, education campaigns. So yet again, another spot where you can go to find information. Stanford University has also released a Cannabis Awareness and Prevention Toolkit. And again, all these things are included in the handout for you. You can find links to, to get those. And truth, I haven't reviewed this in its entirety, but I love the Stanford University e-cigarette and vaping education toolkit. And so I suspect that this is also a wonderful resource. So check that out and see what you can find there. The e-cigarette and vaping toolkit, I love that it has a lot of lesson plans for, for teachers. Um, and so I, I suspect some of it is, is similar um, in the cannabis awareness and prevention toolkit. So, um, so Jamie and I fangirl over Sue Thaw from Community <laughs> Anti-Drug Coalitions of America. She's their public policy consultant. If you ever heard Sue Thaw speak, she is dynamic and um, the the types of work that she focuses on is really in how to engage grass tops leaders. And another thing that she tends to focus on quite a bit is, you know, how the industry is, how they're, how they're being successful. And from a public health perspective, if we want the public health perspective to be part of this conversation, what we need to do in order to catch up. Something, when I was thinking about Sue Tha this morning, one resource that I forgot to include on this, but I think she's terrific, so you might want to, to write down her name. Um, it's Joan McGuire, and I can't even remember the state that she's from, but Scott Gonier at NEPTTC can find her, I just know. I think and she's she Colorado. Does a lot. She, is she Colorado? I think so, yeah. Okay, if anyone knows, type it in the chat where we can find Joan McGuire. But Joe McGuire's work focuses on employment issues. And so it's really wonderful, not only that we have these formal resources, but we also, all these experts in the field in different areas 
um, are available to us. And so her work comes from that sort of employment lens. And I would encourage checking that out if you're speaking with employers. Smart Approaches to Marijuana is another resource. They are a nonpartisan organization that um, focuses in, I mean, I guess what I would say is, you know, they're, they are what they say they are about Smart Approaches to Marijuana. But from everything that I have seen, a lot of the work that they do focuses in on, okay, so people feel that there's sort of this false choice, this, this it's, it's one way or the other. It's either, um, you know, criminalize cannabis or establish a full scale, full blown commercial market. And what they do is talk about all the space that's in between and all the options that are there and many, many other things too. But that's really what I've gotten from, from Sam Main that I've really appreciated, Sam, that I've really appreciated, really appreciated. I wanted to also take some time to highlight the work of coalitions all across the country on this issue. And so um, one here in our state that I'm particularly impressed with is Healthy Androscoggin, and they are in, uh, located in Lewiston, Maine. And they um, serve Androscoggin County, and they recently did some just amazing work uh, to release some toolkits and resources. And they began their efforts, and I, I'm hoping I'm telling this story correctly because I just heard about this and have, have started looking through their resources. But they did an assessment, and they spoke with healthcare professionals. They spoke with social service providers who I think were primarily WIC um, nutritionists. Uh, women, infants, and children, the, the um, nutrition program. And then they also spoke with people who were in the stage of pregnancy and or breastfeeding. And they used the information that they learned to create fact sheets and toolkits that um, basically they took what they heard from those communities and, and, and used that to frame up their messaging. So they're, this is a fact sheet that they have on pregnancy and breastfeeding, and they also have a toolkit that they uh, did for social service providers and healthcare professionals, which is awesome. Okay. So I'm going to turn it back over to Jamie. Thank you. Um, all right. So Robin has been talking about some of these academic or, um, you know, research-based um, resources that that we have access to and another really valuable um thing or perspective that you have access to is the industry itself and you really want to um become familiar with what the industry is doing the way they the way they talk the way that they work and one of the ways that you can do that is by going to uh, this website, which is ArcView. And ArcView is a like an investors club kind of of people who um, who want to make money in in the cannabis space. Um, and they have webinars that anyone can join. That you can um, sign up for their uh, their listserv. Robin really pioneered this, and I was sure for a long time that she was going to get caught and busted, and they were going to kick her off. And then I joined too, and it, I still feel like they might kick me off. Um, but I tell people about joining this, and um, so far we're all still there. And I think they just probably think that they're going to make some money off of us sometime when really we're doing super sneaky intel. Like that's, that's what we want to do. Um, so ArcView, I would encourage any of you to, to sign up for that. That's pretty, pretty easy. All right, next slide. Um, I'm a podcast listener. I love podcasts. I love that I can learn things while I'm doing other stuff. So um, I, used to do a lot of podcasts and driving, so I'm doing less of that these days, but I also am on a personal mission to increase my um, the number of steps that I make every day. And so um, I have found a couple of podcasts that I like to give me the inside scoop on what's happening in the cannabis industry. So Canna Insider is one that I like, and the other one is on the next slide, and it is called Professionally Cannabis. And so um, these are like, they tend to be around, you know, somewhere between 30 and 50 minutes usually. And they 
um, they showcase like a, an entrepreneur usually or someone who's been in the cannabis space and they talk about how they ended up there and what um, what barriers and obstacles they have had and I find I find these really interesting because they they talk about things from um, you know the the hemp market to um, wine that is um, that is is CBD based wine so they've taken out alcohol and they've in, infused CBD into the winemaking process they talk about every every little step that you could take from from coming up with the idea for a product all the way to getting it into the market and um, they talk about business automation systems and banking and it really is a wonderful way to put your finger on the pulse of what is happening in this industry. It is bigger than I could ever convey to you in words. It's, it's ginormous. And, um, and I would encourage you to figure out, like to just immerse yourself in this so that you can, um, you can convey this to your audiences. Okay, next slide. So I think that you probably have, you could probably figure out that um, I, Robin leads this, Robin leads the the charge in uncovering some of these like resources that it would never occur to me. But um, Robin, as part of what she likes to do in her spare time is Google like cannabis and marijuana in her, um, on her, on her phone. You could do this with an iPhone or, you know, a Samsung or any kind of smartphone um, in the app section. And I've taken to doing it too. So it's contagious, I suppose. Um, but check out the kinds of apps that are related to, um, to the cannabis space and to marijuana. Um, it will, it will blow your mind. Um, one of my favorites is this weed maps that we screenshotted here. And I like weed maps for the same reasons that Robin was talking about the open data for, for Maine and probably for other states. Um, you can get a readout, you can get a, a printed, well, it's not printed, but you, it's a, a map on your phone of where the nearest um, marijuana retailers are, where you could get marijuana. Um, and so, for example, I pulled up Bangor, Maine, where we work, and um, there are eight, eight places that we can buy marijuana in a town that has a residential population of 33,000. So um, it's kind of, it's, it's neat to have that visual aspect to that. And it's real interesting to um, just take a, take a look-see through all of the available apps. If you are waiting for your, um, your Hannaford to go or some other kind of to go grocery store delivery, that's, that's what you wanna look for. It'll, it'll be worth your while. Okay, next slide. And at the start of our presentation also, Mer um, Robin mentioned that we, we look to regular news outlets to get information about the industry. And so um, a few weeks ago, when the fires in California were really raging, I came across this article um, about how the California wildfires are destroying the legal marijuana crop. And it was kind of at this point when I had kind of a humanizing um, experience of, about this, and I'll, I'll tell you how. Um, so I grew up in California, and that makes me probably more, um, makes me feel stronger about this than people who did not grow up in California. But the, another article that I read was about how um, the wineries, the, um, the grape um, crop in Napa was also destroyed. And I know um, having grown up in California and I come from an agricultural community, um, I know firsthand the um, how families depend on these agricultural crops for their their very livelihood. And so it was the first time that I, I put marijuana in that kind of agricultural um, crop, maybe that's the wrong term, but my point is that um, for the first time, I was really understanding that this is an industry that people are feeding their families from that depend on their their livelihood for um, you know the success of these products 
And I hadn't really thought about it that way before, but I think that as we move forward in the work that we do, we need to keep that in mind um, because it's it's important. And um, you know, you could be you could find yourself in front of an audience member who who does rely on the cannabis industry for for their livelihood. Um, okay, next. So whether it is BBC News or the New York Times Magazine, um, we just look to all forms of credible, credible news sources um, to include in, in some of our presentation material and also help us um, help us find ways to tell, tell stories um, and, and create connections, meaningful connections with audiences. Okay, next, next slide in Europe. Thank you. So this is just to give you a bit of flavor and we actually have even more um, more content to share with you that you can use a little bit later on in this presentation. Um, and I, I've hinted around about the need to vet content and how um, you know scary that was for me in the beginning. And I just wanted to to talk a little bit about the process that we hope you might go through to vet the content that you may include in your presentations. Um, so whatever it is you select to share with people that you really understand. Um, under telling one thing in particular that, uh, that we learned early on is that it was really important to be very complete and when we were sharing data and telling our story. And so uh, I, what I, an example I would give is you know, we might see that someone, maybe it might have said in the Rocky Mountain Haida report that there was a 500% increase in um, childhood poisonings, zero to five for that year. And, and that's great, but that's not the full story. And the full story was also sharing how, what the number was. Um, and I think we've been really thoughtful to just be sure that our story, particularly the data we were sharing was as complete for people as possible and that we were not misleading them in any way because I don't know about you but when I hear something like a 500 percent increase that that to me um, lends to ideas about how prevalent something is and so I think it's really important for our, our credibility and our relationships to say yes this is a significant increase and this is what it translates to for a number of people so that people really understand what the impact is. Um, also important for any information that you're sharing to know who, if anyone, benefits from that information getting out there. So is it is it actually coming from a source because somebody's interested in selling a product? I know that some of this is pretty basic to us as preventionists, but I would like to share this when I do this um, when I do this when I do presentations for youth um, and and do sort of that media advocacy, media literacy piece where you talk about, okay, so you see this information, how do you know that it's credible? Where is it coming from? Is somebody trying to sell you something? So those that can be really important to talk about. And then going back to see if you can find the source of the information. And luckily much of this work has been done for us now already, which is great through the NEPTTC and other resources. They've tracked this all back for us, so it's great so that you can quickly go and look at the source yourself and you don't have to do a lot of digging. Another reason that you want to spend a lot of time doing this is so that you are able to anticipate what the counterpoints might be or how that data might be potentially reframed in a conversation out in the community. That certainly happened to us. Um, and I know that if I were to look at the normal website or the Leafly website, they too are sharing data. And it, it certainly has um, a different spin on it and they are playing up um, things in a way that probably isn't the complete story in many cases, but it's important to anticipate that so that you can um, be very solid and, and concrete and um, and able to share that information credibly. The other piece, um, another, another thing I think that we've been successful in doing here um, is to, to avoid trying to hijack an audience, to persuade them to think about something the way that we do. 
um, to persuade them, for instance, to adopt this, this same lens that we have where we're incredibly focused on protecting um, adolescent brain development and those kinds of things. Um, people are naturally resistant to persuasion. And there's a tool that I really like to use. Um, it's called Making Data Talk, I believe. And it talks all about how basically to communicate data, data to lay audiences. And I believe USCDC developed it. And one of the things that they talk about that is our innate sort of um, resistance to persuasion as people. And I, I think we all kind of intuitively know that, but the, that resource frames it up in a real nice way. And um, and, and people, as people, since we're are resistant to, to persuasion, if, if we try to, if someone tries to per persuade us, then we oftentimes get into a spot where we're really being defensive in the way that we're processing anything that they say. So we just don't go there. We just don't do that. Really, our deal is all about sharing the information. And, and broadening someone's lens as much as possible so that they can see a lot more things. And then um, it's really very much like a, you know, we just want you to know about this, whether you like it or you don't like it, this is what we want you to know. This is what's, what's going on. Um, and that just can help people feel safe in environments to look at things in a way that they may not have initially. And that obviously is our goal in a lot of these situations. Somebody who did this beautifully, and I mentioned him already, Scott Gonier. I can remember being in East Millinocket with him one night, and he was talking about marijuana, East Millinocket, Maine, and he was talking about marijuana. And an audience member was talking about, they were sharing their, their personal experience of somebody in their family who had a really serious medical condition. And they really felt like their use of cannabis had helped that person how to have a better quality of life. And the way he responded to that person was just so respectful and it was so, um, you know, curious in some ways and also um, just really kind of aligning himself with that person who was who was curious to learn more about what what we could what we need to understand better about what any health benefits might be related to cannabis and he just did that so beautifully and avoided that a situation where. That person could have been shut down and felt really attacked um, if we had kind of gone in with our preventionist hats on and we said, there is no science to that. And I um, really tried to refute that person's story and experience. And instead, that person remained open throughout that whole conversation and, and it was beneficial. So, you know what you have to do. And then the question is kind of, how do you do that? Um, we've shared just really a truckload of information and this is just kind of a snippet of it. Um, and, and if you've spent any time with Jamie and I before, this will not be news to you that, that we want to, we want you to make sure that you keep that truckload of information in the back of the house, um, it, keep it in the back of your brain as a preventionist, but what you present is definitely a much more succinct, refined, concrete, um, very very simplified message. So it's great to have all of that back of the house stuff, but that's not what we're gonna show um, when we're out in the community doing presentations, you know, most of the time. What we wanna really avoid is cognitive overload for people. Um, and this is ginger ale, I made a note for you, just so you know, in case you thought it was anything else, not that you would, but it's ginger ale, that's what I have in my fridge. <laughs> And this, is, again, is a concept of you've seen our presentation training. We talk a lot about cognitive overload and how to, to um, present information in ways that are brain friendly. And what happens when we overload people is that it's just everything spills over the top. They don't know what to do. They don't know what to do with the 40 slides that you just presented them with on adolescent brain development and, and data from all of these resources and these text heavy slides. They just, they can't, they don't know. It's too much. We've gone too far. When I say they, I mean me too. You know, we all can experience cognitive overload. And so we need to be very careful that we keep our message um, succinct and that it is in, um, you know, bites that, that people can take advantage of. Along that same line of thinking, we have some thoughts for you about the done for you presentations that you're going to find out there. Um, and What's great about them, I've already shared, is that they are meticulously footnoted. They are just rock solid, that you can trust the information that's in there is science-based and evidence-based and informed. Um, however, 
we would submit that many times some of those presentations might not be what you would share with an audience in its entirety. So in some of those presentations, there might be a particular few slides that you would want to highlight for people. And, it, you know, you could come run across an audience where you're going to get into that whole presentation, but it's probably in the minority. And, and rather what you might be doing is pulling content from, uh, from those presentations and using that as sort of your foundation for your talking points that you'll deliver out in the community. And there, here's an example of this for you. This is um, one of the, a slide from one of the NEPTTC slide decks, which is awesome. And this is both the slide itself and the accompanying notes. So as you can see, like this is rock solid. And um, there, what is being talked about here is basically like, you know, where, where and how is THC stored in the body for how long and, um, and all that kind of good stuff. And this is really great for me to know. Now, it would have taken me several, you know, several years ago, it would have taken me a really long time to try to find this information, a very long time, and I don't have to do that now. So I'm, I just am so relieved and happy to have this. But what I might do with this information, so I might have this and know that this is available to me, and I might choose to use this information as sort of my back of the house information. And then when I go and present, let's say I'm doing a presentation, um, to a parent group or to some youth or even, um, you know, to a town council, I might decide to, to share this information by asking a trivia question. So what organs in the human body score the most THC? Ask people to guess, get them really interested and then sort of give them a little bit of the backstory about which ones do and how come and what does that mean about how THC is stored and, and processed in the body? All right. So um, Robin has really pulled back the curtain on a lot of the, um, the characteristics that have led us to have pretty successful um, marijuana prevention presentations. Um, I think the thing that um, one additional thing I can, I can think to add is that um, it's perfectly fine to say, I don't know. So if, if someone asks you a question um, and you don't know the answer, that's where we default is, I am not sure, but I'm happy to get the information to you. And um, I think that's really built our credibility up over time because um, instead of acting like we might know the answer to something, we're instead pretty honest and say, I'm not sure. And um, they, they, um, they don't question the rest of <clears throat> the quest, uh, the, the rest of our message. So I wanted to just throw that in because I just thought about it today. Um, so one of the, one of the things that, that we do in the marijuana pre prevention presentation that we give is that we use the magic of surprise with, um, all of these images. So, um, the, the industry has given us such rich visual imagery of things that are occurring in the industry right now, it is like you know a plaza hotel buffet for your eyes. It is, um, it's awesome. You cannot compete with it. You couldn't find a, a better situation um, to have all of these ways to communicate your message. It really is. It really is incredible. Um, people don't expect to see the things that you can show them and that surprises them and it makes them want to see, want to see more. So we're going to go through just a couple of the, the images that we've included in our presentations over time. Um, next slide. These are just some mints. And go to the next one. This is a rookie cookie and this is a, a, a cookie for it has lower amounts of THC in it, so it's designed to initiate people into using marijuana if they're not used to it. And next slide. This one is one of our favorites. Um, so we wanted to um, draw some comparisons between this um, a, a candy bar from a company that is in Colorado to a well-known milk chocolate bar that I'm sure you have had the pleasure of meeting before. And so those are the same size candy bars, but in the one that has um, THC in it, it has 100 milligrams of THC, 
it's equivalent to the THC level in 20 joints together from the 1970s. And so every time we um, use this in a presentation, you can hear the audience just gasp um, at, at this. Um, and it really is a, is a way, does a good job of showing that, um, that we're dealing with different products. I mean, um, it's, it's not the same landscape. I, we've talked about the growth of the industry and where it's going, and it is no longer about having a dime bag and rolling your own joint and going out to, you know, um, the gravel pits and smoking weed with your friends. That's not it. I've never done that before anyway, by the way. Kidding. Um, the other thing I wanted to, the other kinds of images we um, put into our presentations are um, products that seem to appeal to kids. And we talked about this in the beginning of the presentation um, a little bit earlier when I talked about finding that bag, the edibles bag with my daughter. So we always think it's important to, um, to really showcase some of those kinds of products with bright colors and um, images that appeal to kids. You can go to the next slide. We came across this, um, this edible um, package, I guess, container from um, someone that we know um, was given this. At any rate, it doesn't matter, but the, we wanted, we, we show what the edible market in California is looking like. And then the next slide shows a um, couple of, of um, better representation of what the actual edibles look like. So this is this is nice. People tend to like to see this stuff too. Now one more slide. And um, just a couple more um, examples of products that clearly are designed to um, with with kids um, with kids in mind. All right. We also like to provide um, some examples of what electronic um, delivery devices are like so that people understand that these are kind of stealth um, delivery systems that uh, is, is, is the way that people are using this today. Okay, next slide. And um, wax. This is wax, the highest, uh, that has the highest concentration of THC. Next slide. Um, this is a picture of the Marlboro cup that Robin has sitting in her office somewhere, unless she's taken it home to wash it. And um, no, look here. <laughs> um, we included this in this presentation so that um, it would be top of mind for you that Marketing isn't always what you think it is or should be. Um, in other words, running an ad on television or putting a glossy collection of photographs in a magazine or putting something on the side of a bus is the kind of advertising that I think we all think of when we think of advertising. And we wanted to just remind you of um, so a very successful marketing campaign that was put on by the company who owns Marlboro. And the, the goal for this company was to um, have people smoke as much as they possibly could and generate all of these points. So they got points for by, you know, the UPC symbols or whatever. And then they would mail them into Marlboro and Marlboro would had these products that you could purchase. And so um, Robin, Robin got this cup. I know my father-in-law ended up with a, um, an ice chest and I've seen him in some other stuff like a coat. Um, so anyway, that's the kind of, of um, marketing that doesn't look like marketing that, that you should have your eye on with, um, with the cannabis industry. All right, next slide. Now we wanted to talk a little bit about how pervasive this industry is, and that just means it's everywhere. And you could, um, I mean, I just thought about um, breakfast waffles, like um, what do you call those, Lego, Ego, Ego waffles? And I was just wondering that, I, I wonder if they have a THC infused frozen waffle yet, and if they don't, when that's gonna be, because they have honestly thought of everything else. So the next couple of slides here, we're gonna look at some dating apps. 
So if you, this is the kind of thing you can find on your smartphone while you're waiting for your grocery delivery also. <laughs> so we had, um, we had the 421, then there is high there, and then the next one is 420 singles. So if you have a desire to, to meet someone who shares your interest in cannabis, you have lots of ways to do it. All right, next slide. This is a closer look at the 1906 company that we have on the um, our opening slide for this presentation. And 1906 references the year that cannabis was, um, uh, like the prohibition of cannabis in the United States. And this really um, shows the direction of the, the industry. Um, their tagline is highly functional formulas that help you do all the, the life stuff better. All right, now I want you to think of something. Um, think about this. Think about the people in your life who have little aches and pains, who might have recurring headaches, who might have back problems, who um, might just generally not feel well sometimes, who have trouble sleeping, who are a little anxious. This is the market. This is, this is the cannabis market. So um, I have friends who um, use CBD aids to sleep, who um, give CBD oil to their dog. Anything that you can think of, and I'm not kidding you, um, is what the industry is, the industry is looking to infuse whatever that is with THC or CBD, um, and so the market that was once like, oops, I hear an echo. Um, the market that was once, Robin, do you hear that echo? Okay, I can hear it. Hear it okay, sorry, this is gonna drive me nuts. But anyway, um, so what used to be a small kind of specialized market is, is now much bigger and, um, encompasses way more people than I think any of us could could ever think that the potential market all right next slide this is a um, I think it's self-explanatory you can see what this is this is vaginal cream that has CBD in it and um, our fair Robin likes to frequent TJ Maxx she's a maxinista at heart and one day she came back and she said, oh my goodness, you're never gonna believe this, but they have CBD vaginal cream at TJ Maxx. And boy, we talk about this a lot in our office because we think it's funny and <laughs> ironic and whatever. But um, it's just another example of, of where you can find this stuff. Next slide. And then there's some CBD face cream. And next slide. We have dog biscuits, and the next slide shows that not only do we have dog biscuits, we have products for dogs, we have products for cats, and we have a full range of options of types of products and things that we might want to happen um, for our pets using these products. Okay, next slide. This slide um, was taken out of one of the ARCVIEW publications that we, um, that we found. And what this slide shows is the, the recent and the forecasted market for um, CBD products, which is, is huge, um, 1.9 billion in 2018, and it's projected, I don't know what the projection is gonna be in 2024, but it's gonna be much more than that. And then the bottom two um, photos talk about how um, the United States population doesn't know the difference between CBD and THC um, and really what they do, but they're still buying this stuff. So it's just an illustration of um, the power of marketing, really, and, and the savviness of this industry in being able to market their products. And, and also, I think the willingness and the desire of, of the target market to want to believe that there is something outside of regular pharmaceuticals that can help them with whatever is is ailing them. I think 
We live in a society where people are um, stressed and tired and um, many not feeling well. And they're really looking to um, the emerging cannabis market, many of them, to, to solve these problems for them. All right, next slide. Thanks, Jamie. So we're going to wrap up by going over a few design basics. And these are some uh, concepts that we talk about in our general presentation design and development training. So, um, you know, when I'm not cruising the aisles of TJ Maxx looking for <laughs> different topical aids or sitting in my car, scrolling through the Hi There app, wondering who I might be. Um, or, or, or hearkening back to my time as a former smoker and all of the Marlboro loot that I got. I do also like um, information design, digital and print design. I kind of, that's my new thing that I do instead of collect Marlboro points. Um, Sorry, so. <laughs> I made you feel so bad. She's awesome. You all would love to have her for a friend. <laughs> We have such a good time together. So I think that's just, you know, that's a beautiful thing of getting to work together and do this kind of work. We have such a good time. Um, so thank you, Jamie. So uh, this is just some information that's gonna help you put your final polish, your presentation sparkle, your communication sparkle um, on what you do for your conversations and whether it's a slide deck you're designing or it's a, a handout or a rack card that you want to provide. Uh, these are just a few very few tools and ideas for you to get you started with that work. So one thing that we always request in our presentation um, training is to please, please, please ditch the slide you and the slide you meant, we all know what it is, and Jamie and I didn't coin this phrase, but it is these text heavy, dense slides crammed with information um, that really are not helpful to our audiences. And there are much better ways that we can use the real estate of a slide deck. And we hope that we've shown you some of those today, just as an example of how to use a visual aid in a way that is um, you know, going to be most impactful to an audience. And, and this is just really never it. So if you're putting together a slide or a handout, these are just kind of some general foundational things to keep in mind. Uh, think about the inclusion of a thoughtful image. And we always talk about making sure that we use, as it, use image that, as, that don't reinforce stereotypes. Um, don't exclude groups. So if you're talking about families, you're not necessarily going to do a man and a woman and a child and they're white. Um, being thoughtful to include images that um, that work in the situation also don't don't uh, perpetuate a narrow a narrow lens, um, and that we're we're providing culturally um, appropriate um, appropriate information for our audiences. So there are a lot of images to work with when it comes to marijuana education. We've shown you lots of them today. Um, we also would encourage you to use a cohesive color palette, whether it's a handout or a slide deck, pick two to four colors. We're gonna give you some resources for how to find color palettes and they just really help put that very polished spin on your finished product that, that make you feel confident and credible and really comfortable with your information. And, and, and help make it sticky for your audiences too. And the industry has this down, they know how to do this. So that's another reason to kind of check out the industry stuff. They've got the polish, they've got the jar of glitter and we can have it too with a little work as well. Always make sure that there's a high amount of contrast between your slide background and your font color. Um, same with a handout. So just so it's easy for people to read and see and also make sure to use an easy to read font when you're thinking about color choices, you want to keep in mind um, things, are, uh, things around um, color blindness, um, and there are great tools and resources to, to learn which color palettes to pick that, are, that, are, um, that would be appropriate to make sure that you avoid creating visual aids that um, some people would have difficulty seeing. Okay, here is our just belief that right now physical distancing is not only good for people, but it is good for your images too, folks, okay? So 
sometimes when I see marijuana presentations, people have a lot of really good images that they've included, but they put them all on one slide and they make them teeny tiny and it's really hard to see them. And, and we would say that the best thing to do is give each of these images their own space, their own real estate, their own slide. Um, and, and the likely scenario is that you're talking through each one of these with your audiences anyway. So it's not really gonna be a time savings issue to spread them out over several, several different slides. So just allow the image to speak for itself, give it full screen, let people take it in. Um, that is probably the most impactful way to use an image. We don't have really time to get into data visualization, but we wanted to mention it here because there is so much data that we want to share with our audiences. Um, uh, so this is just a couple of quick things about sharing data. Um, this is a quick data visualization that we did in our marijuana prevention presentation that speaks to the tax revenue. And this was this presentation was done back in 2016 and it was really around the time that there were there was so much attention in the media being paid to all the tax revenue that was coming into the state of Colorado related to um, marijuana sales. And it was just the number, and it was some kind of a number that if it was in your bank account, it would just be, you would be so excited. You wouldn't be on the slip card, you would be doing something else. Um, but that information was never put in a context. And so we did a data visualization to illustrate that while that sounded like a large amount of money, the total story was that it made up less than 1% of the total general fund revenue for that state for the year and that the total state budget itself was $2.6 billion. So put it in a context when you're doing a data visualization. There are lots of um, great strategies for doing engaging data visualizations when it comes to this sort of work. Jamie did an awesome one at one time where um, she did sort of a map and took, at, took a look at the number of marijuana businesses within a certain, um, within you know, certain geographic boundaries and showed how many there were. And then she also added in all the places that you could buy milk and lo and behold, in that area, there were more places to buy marijuana than there were to buy milk. So you can do some really powerful things with data visualizations. We have um, included a few handouts for you since we don't have time to get into this in its entirety that go into how to create data visualizations um, for to design for lay audiences and really for everyone um, and all the best practice tips that um, all data visualization experts agree on so you can go through those and we also included for you our design resource links that we do in our presentation design training that talk about where to find photos how to find color palettes um, how to edit photos where you can how you can get help with designing a handout um, fonts that you might want to use and also how to find us. Yeah, so here we are. Our, um, hey, go to the next slide. Our, um, our information is there. It looks a little funky. Oh, well, you get it. It's info on Spotify. <laughs> and, you know, it doesn't matter. It's fine. Um, everything else looked awesome. It's info-inspired.com. Um, Jamie, I'm at Jamie at info-inspired.com. Robin, Robin at info-inspired.com. Um, here's the thing. If you go to our, um, our website, we have um, lots of different resources up there for you. We have um, more stuff on data visualization and, um, and designing slides and um, articulating goal and all sorts of stuff in, in the blog section. Um, and we love to hear from you. So if you, after we do trainings, like we always give our information out. If you have a question, send it to us, ask us. Um, we usually have a couple of people reach out after every training to um, ask us for advice and guidance and we love to um, we love to help out. We are we are you. We do the same thing that you do. So we would love that. 